I can't. It's simply too large and intricate to summarize in this space. It would require a book. I had the day off from school because it was Washington's birthday. I could have stayed at home, but instead I went to work with my father at the family gas station that my mother and father owned. I volunteered there on weekends and after school to assist my father. I pumped gas, washed windows, checked oil, and helped clients by taking their money and giving them change. I also cleaned the toilets, filled the oil racks with oil cans, emptied the soda machine, and collected money, swept up, and did other duties for my father for 50 cents an hour. That was a lot of money in 1966, when comic books were 12 cents, matinee movie tickets were one dollar, and so on. I could make four dollar per day working weekends for my father, and a dollar fifty per day after school. That equates to thirteen to fifteen dollar per week. So I chose to spend Washington's school holiday with my father. Massive limestone stones towering as high as 30 feet were nearby the gas station. That day was just another very chilly morning with ice on the ground, which happened a lot in the 60s and 70s. So there wasn't much business that day, and I completed all of the other tasks assigned to me by my dad. I asked him if it was okay if I left for a while. I went out into those massive rocks, ones I'd climbed many times before. To cut a long tail short, freezing and expanding water in the fissures of these rocks had loosened a portion of rock on its 15 to 20 foot high boulder. The piece was perched on an edge that appeared to be attached to the side of a larger rock. I'd climbed over it several times before, but this time, it broke free. The piece was tear-shaped, narrow and tapering at the top but thick, wide and heavy at the bottom, and stood roughly four feet tall. It snapped off. I tumbled backwards from the massive boulder, and this stone landed directly on top of me. In fact, I rode it all the way to the ground. It was probably between 400 and 500 pounds. I don't remember much else at the time, besides hearing a screaming voice in the distance. Oh no. I'm dead. I felt strangely removed from it. The next thing I knew, I was floating in the air, dazed, not knowing where I was, who I was, or even what I was. There was an eerie sense of amnesia. I tried to get my bearings and orient myself to my surroundings by carefully observing. My mind was instantly overwhelmed with information. As I peered at the boulder, I realized its chemical makeup could describe every curve, concavity, and convex shape using mathematical concepts that were both familiar and foreign to me. I couldn't believe how clear my mind was. Then I became conscious of a body. I used the following words because they express how I felt, but they were not used. In fact, I wasn't even thinking in words. I became aware of a malfunctioning biological unit. I regarded it in the same manner that I would regard a crunched up car. I swept over this body, seeing barely nothing between the boulder laying on it and the ground. It was simply a fraction of an inch. The face was distorted and dark with its mouth open and muck and blood strewn on its brow. It wasn't moving or breathing, and the face appeared to be familiar, but I couldn't place it. Then it struck me. It was my own face. It appeared strange, partially because it was dead and partly because I'd always viewed myself in a mirror. When it was outside of my body, it appeared different. All of my memories came flooding back to me at that point. Who I'd been who my family and friends were, what I'd done, and what I'd thought. Then it slammed into me like a ton of bricks. I was supposed to be dead. But here I was, still alive and completely cognizant. How is that possible? I became terrified. I had died. Dad was going to be furious at me for killing myself. When I realized I was dying, my terror level skyrocketed. Dad isn't going to be upset with me. I'm no longer alive. Oh my god. What will happen to me? Then all of my anxiety was forced out of me, and I can only compare it to being bone-chilling cold and standing in front of a lovely warm fire. All your shivering and coldness eventually dissipate, and your muscles relax as the warmth of the fire fills you. I heard fire behind me and turned around to find a man with black wavy hair and a black beard, all short-cropped and with dark well-tanned skin. 
His eyes sparkled like diamonds in the sunshine, and his robe was similar to a monk's robe, only it was bright white and shimmering. It flowed about him, with visible eddies and currents. When this being smiled at me, I was immediately flooded with love. I felt like I was going to burst from all the love. I couldn't stop myself. I've never felt more loved. Thoughts were communicated straight to me by this creature. There were no words spoken. He said that this was an accident and that I may return if I so desired. I informed him in my head that there was no way that body could work. It had been squished flat. He said he could make it function again. Did I wish to return? I was curious about my alternatives. What would happen if I chose to return? And what if I did not? I was assaulted with a packet of images no sooner than I had these thoughts. It demonstrated briefly what would occur if I did not return. Because I wasn't here, I saw my sister become addicted to drink and drugs, and her life spiral out of control. I witnessed my father commit himself as a result of my death, shortly after my mother divorced him over the issue of my death. My paternal grandfather died, his heart devastated by my loss and my father's suicide. There were two blows that took away all of his enthusiasm in life. The effects continued indefinitely. My mother spent the rest of her life miserable, heartbroken and lonely, and I saw a procession of faces of people I'd never meet whose lives that have influenced. But now, I'd never know any of them, and they'd never know me. The man in the white robe had me and my sister under his control. I've always adored my little sister, and I would have chosen to return for her alone. But witnessing the anguish it would inflict everyone else, mom, dad, grandparents, friends, cousins, aunts, and uncles, I had no choice but to return. Then there was a second set of images, showing what would happen if I went back in time. I ignored the obvious. My father did not commit suicide. My sister fared well. Mom was ultimately content. My grandfather was overjoyed that his first grandson was attending university. My grandfather was a legal immigrant from Italy who never advanced beyond the fourth grade, and he valued education above all else. When his children graduated from high school and I became the first of his grandchildren to attend a major university, he cried like a proud rooster. But what I concentrated on in the second package was the cost of returning. I knew I'd be able to walk again, that everything I'd lost would be restored, albeit only momentarily. I would endure terrible agony in my later life, probably 10 to 15 years after the accident, and it would affect me for the rest of my life. I opted to return. He grinned as if he knew I'd choose the more difficult option because of how I felt from my family and friends. I was back in my body with a snap and a pop. It was packed with crackling electricity, as well as sounds and emotions. I had no breath, no air, and this massive rock was suffocating me. With my one free left hand, my right arm was pinned under the boulder. I grasped the little end of the tear near my nose and rolled it off me like it was made of paper mache. After I drew a painful breath of air, it seemed as if someone had thrust the blade into my right side. It was a terrible breath, so severe that I passed out and slid down an embankment into a depression. Yet as my body flopped over and over, rolling downhill, I was seeing it from the top of my head, half in and half out of my wrecked body. I landed in a clump of vegetation at the bottom of this hollow. My legs were numb and I couldn't move them. I was immobilized from the waist down and could hardly breathe. Every feeble breath wounded me like a blade deep into my right chest. But I was alive, just as the man in the glowing bright white robe had predicted, and I had no idea how he accomplished it. I could feel and hear the crackling of electricity going through me and I knew I needed to get treatment right now. But how does one get out of a deep raven surrounded by muddy slopes and rising limestone stumps 15 plus feet high with a shattered back and legs that not only don't operate but also don't feel? Just then, two boys topped the slope above me, one of whom I recognized as Johnny. I called to them faintly and Johnny knelt by me. I told him to go get my father since I was terribly harmed. 
I didn't know the other lad who lived just up the hill above the raven where I was laying. He dashed to inform his father to summon an ambulance. There were no paramedics back then. After then, everything went quickly. My dad eventually discovered me as he ran aimlessly about the limestone field, calling for me. My father was the hardest, most courageous guy I'd ever known. Yet when he finally got to me, I saw panic in his eyes. He tried to take me up and carry me out, but I refused because my back was damaged. Soon after, the ambulance arrived at the top of the hill near the house of the unknown boy, and a little army of guys appeared from who knows where. I was tied to a board that was carefully moved below me. A tiny army of guys handed me from hand to hand up the muddy hill that led out of the raven. The men's line disintegrated in the slick mud, and I began to slide back down the slope, only to be caught and held by my gorgeous papa, who refused to let me fall. He drove his feet into the muck, cut footholds, and hung on until the other men could re-establish their footholds and get me over the hill and into the ambulance where my mother was waiting. It was a long ride to the hospital, and on the way, I begged my mother to wash the blood and muck off my face, which startled her because she had no idea. She got a Kleenex from her handbag, soaked it with her spit, and used it to clean my face. My face was so numb that I couldn't even feel her stroking it. I was x-rayed, my clothes were ripped off, and the x-rays revealed no inside damage, but I could feel the electricity from the white-robed man slowly bleed away over the next 11 hours. Despite the fact that I was disoriented from the morphine they had put into me to relieve my pain, I knew I was dying again. My blood pressure was dropping, and I overheard them discussing a possible leaking spleen, so it was evident they needed to operate. My personal doctor approached me and said they needed to operate and asked whether I was okay with it. He was such a sweet and gentle doctor. Oh, okay, sure. As long as you guarantee me I'll wake up, I responded. Promises are precious in my family, and you never break one until the entire universe stops you from doing so. And even then, you finish it later. He made the pledge which meant I'd survive the surgery. He made a vow to me. They gave me an anesthesia and told me to count backwards from 100. Do it again, the orderly urged after I cleared to zero. So I did, and since I had hit zero again, I believed he'd just asked me to do it again, so I did it again. They were wheeling me into an operation room. They hauled my body up onto two parallel steel bars with multiple nurses and orderlies, with my spine nestled between the two rails. My body was draped in blankets. A hood was placed over my face or head. A massive spotlight hung over me, and the room was quite cold. We're losing him, I heard someone say. Then his blood pressure dropped to zero. It meant my heart had ceased beating. I watched as the doctor, the chief surgeon, cut me open with a saw. I still have an unsightly scar across my chest from when he ripped me open. I heard him say, Oh my dear God. The internal damage was severe. In truth, I should not have survived the original rock strike. My heart was pushed up under my left armpit and out of its natural cavity. My stomach and liver had been pushed into my right lung, which had collapsed around them. My diaphragm was gone. My intestines, including my spleen, were all stuffed into a space right above my pubic bone. Because there was nothing in my abdomen, nothing looked out of place on my x-rays. I overheard the surgeon explain that he'd seen car wreck victims die with injuries similar to mine. He thought it was incredible that I'd lived this long. He sawed open my throat and pushed his hand into my chest. I'm guessing he went after my heart to massage it back to life. But then something strange happened. People could be heard praying for me. I was suddenly there and I could see my doctor. He was kneeling on the floor of a waiting area surrounded by seats. My mother, father, and someone else stood nearby. In that room, they were all kneeling on the floor, praying for my life. The next thing I know, I'm back in the operating room where the surgeon is desperately attempting to save my life. As he massaged my heart, I found myself drifting away, and the further I drifted, the darker the room became and the further distance his voice sounded. 
I found myself well above the operating theater, where I should have been on a higher floor or outside on a roof. But I wasn't. Instead, I found myself floating at the entrance to a tunnel or vortex. I was drawn in, and that's when my trip really began. I received a life review and was shown about the other side by a person who was my guardian angel or teacher, whom I learned to call Professor, although he had a fantastic sense of humor. I was shown numerous heavens and asked to see what hell was like if one existed, and there was, but it was not like I expected. I even asked to see Jesus and apologize, and I was given interesting historical facts that I was able to verify afterwards. All of this is far too complicated to cover here, including countless future forecasts that have all come true, save one, which I believe is still to come.